Welcome to the message for Sunday, September 10th, 2023. I'm Pastor Teresa Heiser from the Penns Valley Charge of the United Methodist Church. And this is the final in our three message series called The Journey Begins, because we're kind of getting the groundwork under us for a series that's going to happen pretty much through pretty much the rest of fall leading up to Advent. And it's going to help us to be prepared to answer some pretty common questions that Christians are asked. So before we get into the scripture passages, I want to share with you these centering words. People may not like us for being honest, but it truly is the scriptural pathway of love. Jesus gave us a plan for settling conflict in the church. Let's go now to the passages on which the message is based today. Instructions are given for the celebration of the first Passover when Israel remembers God's gift of the Exodus from slavery. They are literally the first to be saved by the blood of the lamb. So hear this passage from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. This is about the Passover lamb. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995, which is a word-for-word -word translation of the original language. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both male and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Our second passage comes from Romans 13, verses 8 to 14, reading again from the New American Standard Bible. And in this letter, Paul addresses discord to a divided congregation in Rome, reminding them the unity of the church is based upon Christ's command that we love each other now, not later. So hear these words. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. 
Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And then our final passage is once again more instruction. Instruction that is meant to help us to fight against the sin nature that we're born with. This is Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20, and it talks about discipline and prayer. And in, in specifics, Jesus is instructing his disciples on what to do when they have been wronged by a fellow disciple, someone else in the church. And this is how we are to act. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name... I am there in their midst. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this particular passage, in this last of our Journey Begins uh, mes messages, we're going to talk about how do I fight like a Christian? Having a healthy relationship requires a few things. But having a healthy relationship with God is very much like any other relationship in that there is time set apart that is intended to be spent together. There is conversation. There's learning more about each other. There's reaching more understanding. There's seeing where we have disagreements and then working them through. Relationship changes us. Now, we know that when, we, when we've when met somebody that made us happy, we're, we're more happier, right? And people might even remark about how we've changed. Or we could see in other people how someone might be changing them and impacting them. It could be for the better, could be for the worse, but we can see how relationship changes people. So if you ignore someone that you claim to be in relationship with, what does that usually make happen? Separation. You can't be in relationship with someone you are ignoring. And separation can be good, and separation can be bad. During the days of the first century Christians, there was a mandate in Rome that everyone must proclaim Caesar as Lord. Okay? Participation was required. And they also had to put a pinch of incense into a bowl for Caesar. Everyone was required to go through these motions. All right, it had to be seen and heard. Because you can, people can only see and hear your outward motions. They can only see what you do and they can only hear what you say. They cannot see your heart. They cannot see your mind and they cannot hear your thoughts. Is that fair? Okay. The citizens of Rome, they had lived by this creed, Caesar is Lord, but... There was a tiny little problem, and that is that the first century Christians also had a creed, and this was a new creed, and this new creed is Jesus is Lord. So this was creating some tension. This was creating an issue. In Luke 16, verses 10 and 13, Jesus said, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. 
No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Two things cannot be true in this instance, and they know it. If they are proclaiming out loud, Caesar is Lord and in public, and then going off over here in public and saying, Jesus is Lord, what are they doing? They are being hypocritical. Not to mention they are lying. Because if, if you are, you can't believe these two things to be true. One or the other is your Lord. This was a problem. And so to those first century Christians, this practice of calling Caesar their Lord and then sealing it with this pinch of incense, although many were portraying it as just something that we do, it's just something that we say and it's just something that we do. There's really no meaning under, underneath it. We're not accepting or acknowledging that, yeah, there actually is deeper meaning in doing it and saying it. It became for them a stumbling block to the full surrender that they felt for Christ. It was like cheating on Christ. Jesus is my Lord. I can't go around and say someone else is, even if it is Caesar. This was a problem. This was a moral dilemma that really wasn't a dilemma. They already knew what the answer was. They were struggling in the doing. So you have Caesar thinking it's really good for him that people would call him Lord. Caesar really believed that was a good thing. But in Matthew 18, starting in verse 7, Jesus talks about this. Jesus says, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. And it is. It's inevitable that stumbling blocks come to us sometimes several times a day. But woe to the man through whom the stumbling block comes. So Caesar may think it's a great idea to call him Lord, but is it? If he's the one who's forcing these people to do it, is it going to turn out well? In Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, Jesus' words are modernized to say, if you give God's people a hard time, bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. So why does Jesus say this? Church is believed to be the most passive place in the world, is it? <laughs> is it? Yet I bet every one of us has a story of internal strife that happens in a church. I've experienced it. Maybe you've experienced it. If you've never been in a church, maybe you've heard about it from somebody else. Internal strife in sinning within the church against others and the church disagreeing or full on arguing, fighting over things that have nothing to do with glorifying God or making disciples. But Jesus provides us with plenty of insight about forgiveness within the Christian community. And, and I want to offer a really bad example of not dealing with internal strife within a church well at all. And the damage that can be done when that happens, I have permission to share this story. There was a church where the church leadership was so intimidated by their longtime organ, organist that uh, despite documented, reported ethics violations that have hurt people inside and outside of that church, they could not muster up the courage to fire her. They couldn't muster up the courage to talk to her about it, let alone dismiss her from her paid duties. It was much easier to say nothing than to face the wrath of Ruth. I just created the name. They decided instead to hint at something by throwing her a very nice retirement party. Unfortunately, Ruth did not take the hint um, and showed up Sunday at the organ, ready to play. So the church leaders also, and again, unable to muster the courage to tell Ruth the truth, to have a discussion about what was going on, having perhaps one person go and have that discussion. And if that doesn't go well, two people go, bring another, another person along, have the discussion again. If that doesn't go well, go to that church leadership, have them all discuss it with this person. Nope, they didn't have the courage or the wherewithal to do that. They came up with a different idea. Give the organ away. So what happened was, Ruth shows up on Sunday to play an organ that is not there. 
public humiliation of the organ player was their better idea than the way to deal with conflict in the church set forth by Jesus. As you might imagine, the church paid a very hefty price because they not only lost their organist, their organist left with a horrible story to tell about that church. And unfortunately, the story was true. The place where the gospel should be obvious through the interactions amongst the people, especially amongst the leadership, became a place where the people were far more likely, especially that leadership, far more likely to gossip and do that behind closed doors instead of having constructive conversations in their meetings that are going to actually bring about actions that glorify God. They became a place where they were much more likely to nurture old grudges in the dark while dramatically denying them in the light. So let's look again at Jesus' three steps to conflict resolution in the church, which is universal actually for all people, but you can kind of apply it to your own life. But we're going to look at these now. Conflict resolution, according to Jesus, within the church, and it also works very well outside of the church, are step one, go directly to the person who's wronged you and speak alone. If that does not work, bring an unbiased third party in to give perspective on the issue, hear both sides, and offer their perspective on how best to resolve the issue. If that does not work, step three, involve church leadership as the church is meant to be mediator and peacemaker. So why do you think Jesus wants you first to go to the person who wronged you and talk to them? Go directly to them, talk to them. Well, if you don't do that, now keep in mind, we do have safe sanctuaries rules in place. And, and I'm not saying negate those things because they're in, um, we have those policies to protect people. So we want to make sure that we're doing anything that we do safe sanctuaries wise. But people in the church know all about that. And if you need to know what the safe sanctuaries policy is for your church, by all means, ask uh, the leadership in your church. But why do you think it is that Jesus says, go to that person and talk this out? Do it first. Do it right away. Well, if you don't do it right away, what happens? Do you think about it? Do you think about it a lot? Do you maybe go to someone else and talk to them about it instead of going directly to that person? In the story I shared, uh, the leadership just hoped that the organist would figure out what they were doing, um, what that organist was doing was hurting people, and they would just figure it out on their own without anyone pointing it out to them, without anyone having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Did it work? Of course not. How can that person know what it is that you're thinking unless you are going to go and tell that person. I am not a mind reader. I do not know any mind readers. If I want you to know something, I cannot expect to give you hints and have you get it. Secret to a long and happy marriage, by the way. I have to tell you, <laughs> same with me. If you want me to know something, you need to tell me and then I will know. So without that, I can't guarantee that I'm going to know. If I don't bring understanding and resolution, then step two requires that I get this third party. And did you see that I put disinterested third party? You can't be bringing your best friend along with you or the closest person confidant you have in the church or maybe even that person you went to first instead of going to them so that they can tell that person why you're right and they're wrong. That is not how that works. So hopefully that was spelled out really well in how that works to bring about and mediate a peaceful resolution. That's really what that person's role is when they come along with you in step two. And if that does not work, well, then it's really good to get the church leaders to meet specifically and hopefully with that person in order to hear both sides of what's going on and then work together to bring about the best outcome for the mission and ministry of the church. Now, think about the scenario that I shared with you about Ruth the organist. How might that situation have been handled better if they had actually gone to that organist first? 
and gone through all of the steps if necessary, might they still have their organist? Because they never had a complaint about the playing, never had a complaint about that beautiful music. It was other things that were the problem. If they would have addressed that problem peacefully, what good might have come from that? What example would that have set for all the people who were aware that there was an issue there? Oh, there was so much good. There was so much good that could have come from that if they had done it properly. They actually did harm instead. They went about doing things the way they thought would be best instead of the way that was thoughtfully and wonderfully provided by Jesus. And they didn't do good. <laughs> In fact, they were not attending to the ordinances of God. The church is not perfect because we are not perfect. Christ is perfect. And Christ's instruction is also perfect. So we're reminded in the passage today that we must work to assure that our church body is Christ-centered in that we are a place of healing, that we're a place of reconciliation for everyone who comes through that door, not to mention the community that we serve. All instruction from God is meant for that common good. Whether they come to the church on Sunday or not, it is intended for the common good. We're to get along with our neighbors, folks. We're to get along with our neighbors. We're to find that peaceful reconciliation. Jesus promises that he will be present wherever two or more are gathered in his name to resolve conflict within the church through what can be tough, what can be really uncomfortable, but truthful conversations that make reconciliation possible. Without them, it's impossible. Amen. Peacemakers are blessed. We are blessed when we can show other people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, help us to live as your word teaches Christians in the church to live and give us the grace to love each other, to settle our disputes with truth telling coupled with compassion, to right our wrongs with honesty combined with graciousness. Guide us in becoming the sort of congregation that the world can look upon and know that you are a great Savior and Lord by how well we are able to love one another. Amen. Amen. So now that we know that we are to fight for Christ, not fight each other, um, we're going to talk next week about how to forgive like a Christian. Real grace means losing count of wrong. Until then, you are prepared to walk away from the darkness into the light. Go into this world confident in Christ's love and God's eternal presence with you. Go now to be witnesses for good and a bearer of peace to all you meet. Go in peace. Amen. Have a wonderful and very blessed week.